mentioned we're in a big bubble. Can you elaborate on that, and how is this likely to play out? When you print money on the scale that modern nations are printing it, we're getting into new territory in terms of size. There's never been anything quite like what we're doing now. We do know from what's happened in other nations, if you, if you try and print too much money, it eventually causes terrible trouble. And we are closer to terrible trouble than, than we've been in the past, but it may still be a long way off. When Volcker, after the 70s, took the prime rate to 20% and the government was paying 15% on its government bonds, that was a horrible recession lasted a long time, caught with a lot of ag agony. I certainly hope we're not going there again. I have conditions that allowed Volcker to do that without an interference from the pol politicians were very unusual. And I think in 2020 hindsight, it was a good thing that he did it. I would not predict that our modern politicians will be as willing to permit a new Volcker to get that tough with the economy and bring on that kind of a recession. So I think the new troubles are likely to be different from the old troubles. You may wish you had, you had a Volcker-style recession instead of what you're going to get. The troubles that come to us could be worse than what Volcker was dealing with and harder like to fix. Think of all the Latin American countries that print too much money. They get strongmen and so forth. That's what Plato said happened in the early Greek city-state democracies. One person, one vote, a lot of egality, and you get demagogues, and the demagogues lather up the population, and pretty soon you don't have your democracy anymore. I don't think that was a crazy idea on Plato's part. I think that accurately described what happened in Greece way back then, and happened again and again and again in Latin America. We don't want to go there. We've done something pretty extreme, and we don't know how bad the troubles will be, or whether we're going to be like Japan or or something a lot worse. What makes life interesting is we don't know how it's going to work out. I think we do know we're flirting with serious trouble. I think we also know some of our earlier fears were overblown. Japan is still existing as a civilized nation, in spite of unbelievable excess by all former standards in terms of money printing. Think of how seductive it is. You have a bunch of interest-bearing debts, and you pay them off with checking accounts, which you're no longer paying interest. Think of how seductive that is for a bunch of legislators. You get rid of the interest payments, and you just, the money supply goes up. It seems like heaven. And of course, when things get that seductive, they're likely to be overused. My way in life was not predicting little short-term differences between the Russell Index and the Standard & Poor's Index. I don't have any opinion about which index is better at any given time. I never even think about it. I'm always just looking for something that's good enough to put Munger money in, or Berkshire money in, or Daily Journal money in. I want to swim as well as I can against the tides. I'm not trying to predict the tides. If you're going to invest in stocks for the long term or real estate, of course there are going to be periods when there's a lot of agony and other periods when the, there's a boom. And I think you just have to learn to live through them. And as Kipling said, treat those two imposters just the same. You have to d deal with daylight and night. Does that bother you very much? No. Sometimes it's night and sometimes it's daylight. Sometimes it's a boom, sometimes it's a bust. I'm just, I, I believe in doing as well as you can and keep going as long as they let you. What impact has passive investing had on stock valuations? Oh, huge. That is, that's another thing that's coming. We have a new bunch of emperors and they're the people who vote the shares in the index funds. Maybe we can make Larry Fink and the people at Vanguard Pope. All of a sudden, we've had this enormous transfer of voting power to these passive index funds. That is going to change the world. I don't know what the consequences are going to be, but I predict it will not be good. We have a hugely strong economy, hugely strong technical civilization. That's not going away. You can't believe what a modern factory looks like when you fill it with robots. And that's coming more and more and more. And it's coming to China, too, for that matter. And so those trends are inevitable. I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I think it does create adjustment problems. If you have a fine unionized job and they replace you with a robot, you've got a difficult problem. And if you've got a company like Kodak and they invent something new that obsoletes your product, you have a problem too and you solve that by dying. A lot of people don't like that solution. I don't much care for it myself. Because all those problems are real, and because it's so tempting to get rid of your debt by just giving a guy a non-interest bearing checking account where you used to have to pay him interest every month, not only do we have a serious problem, but the 
solution to it that is the easiest for the politicians and for the Federal Reserve too, for that matter, is just to print more money and solve the temporary problems that way. And that, of course, is going to have some long-term dangers. In Germany, when the Weimar Republic just kept printing money, the whole thing blew up. And that was a contributor to the rise of Hitler. So all this stuff is dangerous and serious. And we don't want to have a bunch of politicians just doing whatever is easy on the theory that it hurt us last time so we can double it and do it one more time. And then we double it again and so forth. We know what happens on that everlasting doubling, doubling, doubling. You will have a very different government if you keep doing that enough. You're flirting with danger somewhere unless there's some discipline in the process. But I don't regard Japan as in some terrible danger. Having They've done a huge amount of this and gotten by with it. I don't think we'll be as good at handling our problems as Japan is. If taxes were not an issue, what are your thoughts on going to cash today and waiting for better opportunities to deploy that cash over the next 12 months? Is it a sensible idea in your mind? In my whole adult life, I've never hoarded cash waiting for better conditions. I've just invested in the best thing I guess I could find. I don't think I'm going to change now. And the Daily Journal's used up its cash. Now, Berkshire has excess cash, quite a bit of excess cash. But it's not doing that because it knows, thinks it knows how to time investments. It, it just can't find anything it can stand buying. So we don't have a solution to your problem. We, we're just coping with it, as I've described. Why is Berkshire not picking up or adding any new companies to its profile? Is the management getting too conservative with M&A? The reason we're not buying this is we can't buy anything at prices we're willing to pay. It's just that simple. Other people are bidding the price up. And a lot of the buying is not by people who really plan to own them. A lot of it is fee-driven buying. Private equity buys things so they can have more fees by having more things under management. Of course, it's a lot easier to buy something you use somebody else's money. We're using our own money, or at least that's the way we think of it. I've always believed that nothing was worth an infinite price. Even an admirable place like Costco could get to a price where you would say that's too high. But I would argue that if I were investing money for some sovereign wealth fund or some pension fund, 30, 40, 50 year time horizon, I would buy Costco at the current price. I think it's that strong an enterprise and that admirable a place. By the way, it's not a tragedy that Berkshire has some surplus money they're not investing. We look more responsible with the extra wealth. And we are more responsible with the extra wealth. The shareholders who are worried about the future because it looks complicated and difficult, I want to say to them what my old torch professor said to me, Charlie. He'd say, Charlie, tell me what your problem is and I'll try and make it more difficult for you. And he did me a favor by treating me that way, just repeating his favor to you. When you're thinking the thoughts you're doing, at least you're thinking in the right direction, you're worried about the right things. All you people that are worried about the inflation and the future of the republic and so forth. Well, you have to be optimistic about the competency of our technical civilization. But there again, it's an interesting thing. If you take the last 100 years, 1922 to 2022, most of modernity came in in that 100 years. And in the previous 100 years, that got another big chunk of modernity. And before that, things were pretty much the same for the previous thousands of years. Life was pretty brutal and short and limited and what have you. No printing press, no air conditioning, no modern medicine, no. I don't think we're going to get things that were in what I call the real human needs. Think of what it meant to get, say, first you got the steam engine, the steamship, the railroad, and a little bit of improvement in farming and a little bit of improvement in plumbing. That's what you got in the, in the 100 years that ended in 1922. The next 100 years gave us widely distributed electricity, modern medicine, marmots, fire, fire drills, the automobile, the airplane, the, the records, the movies, the air conditioning in the South. And I think what a blessing it was. If you wanted three children, you had to have six because three died in infancy. That was our ancestors. Think of the agony of watching half your children die. It, it just, it's amazing how much achievement there, there's been in civilization in these last 200 years and most of it in the last 100 years. Now the trouble with it is, is, is that the basic needs are pretty well filled. In the United States, the principal problem of the poor people is they're too fat. 
That is a very different place from what happened in the past. They were on the edge of starving. And what happens is it's really interesting is with all this enormous increase in living standards and freedom and diminishment of racial inequities and all the huge progress that has come. People are less happy about the state of affairs than they were when things were way tougher. And that has a very simple explanation. The world is not driven by greed, it's driven by envy. The fact that everybody's five times better off than they used to be, they take it for granted. All they think about is somebody else has having more now, and it's not fair that he should have it and they don't. That's the reason that God came down and told Moses that you couldn't envy your neighbor's wife or even his donkey. I mean, even the, the old Jews were having trouble with envy. It's built into the nature of things. It's weird for somebody my age because I was in the middle of the Great Depression when the hardship was unbelievable. I was safer walking around Omaha in the evening than I am in my own neighborhood in Los Angeles after all this great wealth and so forth. So, and I, I have no way of doing anything about it. I can't change the fact that a lot of people are very unhappy and feel very abused after everything's improved by about 600% because there's still somebody else who has more. I have conquered envy in my own life. I don't envy anybody. I don't give a damn what somebody else has. But other people are driven crazy by it. And other people play to the envy in advance their own political careers. And we have whole networks now that are, they want to pour gasoline on the flames of envy. I like the religion of the old Jews. I, I like the people who are against envy, not the people who are trying to profit from it. But if you stop to think of the pretentious expenditures of the rich, who in the hell needs a real Rolex watch so you can get mugged for it? Everybody wants to have a pretentious expenditure, and that helps drive demand in our modern capitalist society. My advice to the young people is don't go there. The hell with the pretentious expenditure. I don't think there's much happiness in it, but it, it does drive the civilization we actually have. And, Jerry Miller. And it oh, drives the dissatisfaction. How will this all play out? And what's the best advice you have for individual investors to optimally deal with the negative impact of inflation other than owning quality equities? It may be that you have to choose the least bad of your a bunch of options. That frequently happens in human decision making. The mongers have Berkshire stock, Costco stock, Chinese stock, Su Li Lu, a little bit of Daily Journal stock, and a bunch of apartment houses. Do I think that's perfect? No. Do I think it's okay? Yes. I think the great lesson from the mongers is you don't need all this damn diversification. That's plenty of it. You're lucky if you've got four good assets. I think the finance professors and the that sell the idea that perfect diversification is professional investment. If you're trying to do better than average, you're lucky if you have four things to buy. To ask for 20 is really asking for egg in your beer. It's, it's very few people <laughs> have enough brains to get 20 good investment. It's going to be way harder group that is not graduating from college now. For them to get rich and stay rich and so forth, it's going to be way harder for them than it was for my generation. Think what it costs to own a house in a desirable neighborhood in a city like Los Angeles. I think we'll probably end up with higher income taxes too and so on. No, I, I think the investment world is plenty hard and I don't think the, in my lifetime, 98 years, it was the ideal time to own a diversified portfolio of common stocks, updated a little by adding the new ones that came in like the apples and the alphabets and so forth. I'd say the people got maybe 10 or 11% if you did that very intelligently before inflation and maybe 9% after inflation, 8 or 9%, that was a marvelous return. No other generation in the history of the world ever got returns like that. I don't think the future is going to give the guy graduating from college this year nearly that easy an in investment. I think some people are gifted enough that they can invest in hard to value difficult things. Other people, I think, would be very wise to have more modest ambitions in terms of what they choose to deal with. So I think you have to figure out your level of skill or the level of skill your advisor has, and that should enter the equation. To everyone who finds the current investment hard and difficult and somewhat confusing, I would say welcome to adult life.